Hi guys, welcome back to another video. Uh, we took the I took uh, the show up took the show on the road today. Uh, it's in a beautiful little park near my near my house, and I've got my coffee, and I've got my book, and I got some notes. I always feel like after these videos that there's a million things I wanted to say but I didn't so I thought uh, I'd take some notes take some notes with me um, it's just kind of the way I used to teach just kind of real point for me I always say I could get a two-hour lecture off of <laughs> a few sentences um, but uh, maybe this is a more efficient way so anyway I'm happy to be here uh, it's a really warm day it's 30 degrees out today I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit 85 maybe I don't think maybe 90 I'm not sure but anyway uh, no use complaining it's rained the last couple days which was nice because we've needed the rain uh, okay so today we're talking about Finley's the world of Odysseus and we're just gonna call this um, ongoing uh, ongoing day in the life kind of series of, of, uh, of books so we did the uh, daily life in the uh, uh, ancient Israel. <laughs> and I'm hoping to be able to do uh, daily life in the time of Charlemagne and maybe village life in late Tsarist Russia, if I'm going to be really productive. So anyway, uh, The World of Odysseus. This is a great book. Um, it's... I think if you get if you you, you neglect the, the the introduction and the and neglect the appendices then it'll be a more approachable book for you because the introduction and the appendices are are more scholarly um, so if you want to have a sort of a f funner kind of read um, or, or I don't know a more of a <laughs> uh, what's the word get to the meat I suppose rather than the uh, academic sort of minutia and all that then neglect the introduction and the appendices all right so the basic question here in this book is what can we learn from the Iliad and the Odyssey okay what can we learn about life the life being depicted in those two books now I'm gonna I'm gonna point out some things that are generally well, commonly known but might not be known to re, to people who haven't read the Iliad and the Odyssey so they've have long been attributed to a guy named Homer and that guy ma named Homer might might have existed um, scholars today don't think that one guy wrote the Odyssey or the same guy who wrote the Odyssey wrote the Iliad and vice versa um, there's not a great deal of proof there's some sort of uh, there, there are some thematic differences, some cultural contextual differences um, that kind of un underscore, un um, that reinforce that interpretation that they weren't written by the same guy, um, which is fair enough. So when were they written? Uh, scholars generally guess around 750 BC. Um, now, as with the Old Testament as with uh, you learned the other day from my video Beowulf and all these great legends they were they existed in an oral form before they were ever written down and uh, maybe we'll get more and more into that in the future I'll talk some more about maybe the Old Testament or whatever but most of these ancient stories were recited by bards, by people who had, who had them memorized, they were often recited in a uh, cultic or um, holiday setting, so to speak. So whatever feast day it was or whatever, this was the story that was told. And you can see that kind of in the Old Testament as well, that this story was told during this season or this, t this harvest or whatever. And that story was associated with that harvest right that that's pretty cool it's just like in in uh, 
in Christianity today when the story of the Passover is always read uh, around Easter because uh, as uh, I think St. Paul said Christ is our is our Passover right so the association there is part of the retelling of the story is to relive it and to uh, reenact it in a way and that's what the Catholic belief in in the Eucharist is it's a representation um, a re reinstantiation of the death and resurrection of Jesus which are kind of happening over and over again but actually aren't happening over and over again they say but are really tied back connected back across time because to God time is time is meaningless that it's a reliving that it's a going back to that moment right anyway I'm getting a little off topic here so uh, if they were written down around 750 let's say um, and say it was Homer this guy and and they say that the the the, the writing is is very is ingenious like it's this is not this is not regular writing the Iliad and the Odyssey are instances of great literature okay so whoever happened to write them down was a great writer okay um, and obviously some of the some of the form some of the form of the text comes from oral orality okay so for instance you'll find uh, repeated phrases repeated phrases in the Iliad and the Odyssey especially the Iliad um, reflect that that they were they were uh, recited right they were told from memory okay so a pick particular adjective is always associated with a particular person or a particular object or what have you like Achilles is called the sacker of cities Achilles sacker of cities okay um, for instance um, Troy is whatever Great Walled Troy or, what, or whatever it is I can't remember so 750 if Homer's writing this down or whomever what is he thinking about his own world his own 750 world no clearly not he's clearly looking back into a kind of a golden age which term I have to kind of say well that's not the right term it was the age of heroes okay and this one one thing the author makes clear that Finley makes clear is that um, I don't know if you've ever heard about um, uh, Hesiod's four four eras four stages of history or whatever where he talks about the golden age was the first one then the silver age was the next one and it was worse than the golden age and then the bronze age which is which is an age we talk about and then the Iron Age which again is a, is a period we talk about um, obviously uh, Hesiod sorry big truck going by obviously Hesiod was uh, sorry Hesiod and Homer were aware that um, in the past they used bronze but today we use iron okay bronze is uh, way heavier it's really strong but it's really heavy so if you had a bronze shield or bronze armor or something like that whoo that'd be heavy so if you have iron which we use today all the time it is much lighter I'd, I'd say just off the top of my head I'd say the revolution from bronze to iron will be equivalent in a way to our revol our, our recent change really from from iron to aluminum and perhaps the real change is from iron aluminum to um, carbon maybe like carbon uh, what's the word they use like carbon based materials or whatever so maybe that's a revolution that we're just at the start of here now um, and people look back in 50 years and say oh Colin wasn't aware that uh, that was the revolution going on at the time <laughs> to carbon anyway so Finley again says that yes the writer is writing about 750 BC which is super early right uh, remember um, Plato's not going to be around for another 350 years uh, in fact Socrates dies in 350 years so so someone in, in 750 BC is looking back on the 900s for instance and I thought this was really interesting because um, 
the Old Testament, for instance, a lot of it is written back looking at, so looking at, uh, at the sort of the golden age of Israel, which was the kingship of David, right? So looking back and then uh, sort of the writer of um, uh, Leviticus, uh, anyway, lots of the Pentateuch, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, is looking back on a golden, the old golden age of the patriarchs, right? So Abraham and, and all them. So it's kind of neat. So I mentioned um, Hesiod's four stages. Well, Finley says to the Greeks, there was actually five stages, really. And so right, right in between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age was the Age of Heroes. Okay, So uh, that to them was as important as, for instance, uh, we call it the Apostolic World or whatever the age of the apostles or whatever so that was their golden age in a way was the age of heroes and yes the heroes are um, in a way superhuman um, Homer wouldn't have looked around him in 750 and said oh there's a guy like Achilles or there's a guy like Hector he, he, he had seen nobody like that because that was a heroic age those people didn't live around anymore weren't around anymore so how do you know that uh, Homer is looking back in time? Well, a great example, said Finley, is that Homer had no idea how, why, how, what chariots were for. Okay, and this is, this is a funny thing. If you look in the Iliad, the chariots are depicted as kind of just like tra transportation devices for a warrior to take from the back lines to the front lines and jump off of. Uh, and then, you know, fight somebody after he jumps off the char chariot. That's not what chariots were for. Um, if you remember the great movie um, Gladiator, uh, chariots <laughs> were for fast, uh, brutal attacks from them by means of spears or arrows, probably arrows mostly. Um, so it's like, um, like a, whatever, a, one of those... Uh, Mustangs in World War Two or whatever. Uh, or, uh, what's the modern one? The uh, the the warthog, right? So these are for blistering, sudden, overwhelming attacks. Okay, that's not how Homer depicts them, because when he looked around him, he didn't see any chariots, and he had no idea what they were used for. <laughs> uh, but he knew that people used them in the past. So, um. Per, per, perhaps the most interesting thing about this book is Finley's description of the life and morals of Homer's world. So that 750s world or that 750s poet world looking back on the 900s as he imagined them. That's, that's a big mouthful, but that's kind of what we find in Homer. Okay. Take all those uh, take all of those um, little nuances I just used and say that's what we're talking about here. So it was an aristocratic world, right? So there's no references in Homer to the life of the poor, or, you know, no description, I should say, no, no, no sympathy for, no interest in the life of the poor, the life of the majority of the people at the time uh, in Greece, for instance, or Asia Minor, or... Uh, uh, Crete was as now farming and especially in those rocky places those rocky dry places it was uh, animal husbandry like grazing uh, goats sheep and uh, cattle so um, there's something to be said for what's not talked about and Homer's not interested in that stuff um, he's interested in the aristocratic hero of his imagination and what kind of morality does that give rise to? Well, the morality of the Iliad, for instance, which um, is, in, from our perspective, devoid of compassion, for instance. So when Troy is conquered, yeah, everybody's going to be murdered or enslaved, etc. The Iliad, as you may know, opens up with basically... Um, a priest coming and saying he wants to 
ransom his daughter who was captured by the Greeks and um, Agamemnon the leader says Ugh, all right I'll give you I'll give you your daughter back but I'm taking the the girl that I gave to Achilles as his prize and Ch Achilles says yeah that's really insulting don't do that and so Achilles says yeah if you do that I'm not fighting in your war and so <laughs> the, the next several books Achilles isn't fighting um, and well what does that represent to us well, why is he pouting he's pouting because those those he was dishonored okay we, we might look back on that and say you know what a selfish person yeah selfish it was completely selfish you are you can't make a mistake in saying that our morality translates into their world uh, I, for instance last night I watched Macbeth a beautiful movie uh, movie depiction just recently um, and I couldn't help but think that Shakespeare Shakespeare had it wrong no king or aristocrat at in the age of Macbeth would have eaten himself up over guilt at having murdered the king okay uh, that was a way of life they would have had no compassion for Duncan if he were you know this is just the way of the world it's either kill or be killed and you got to do things that are selfish and life is a con is constant state of warfare in a way we don't walk around with swords today but they walked around with swords then because life was dangerous and constant uh yet constantly alert so let's not poo poo the morality but we have to examine it get to know it and so on so as time goes by think again of this um i always found this funny there's a passage in the Old Testament where in one case it's Abraham and in another case it's Isaac who lie that their wife lie about their wife and say it's not my wife it's my sister so that's in the Old Testament originally because uh, it, it makes uh, Abraham or Isaac look good they're crafty they're smart they're you know foxy and that's the way of Aeneas uh, sorry not Aeneas but Odysseus he's the trickster he's smart he can you know he, he's clever he can he can figure his way out of situations where today we would say he's dishonest he's a liar uh, he's a sneak but in the age of the heroes in and in Homer's time that is virtuous so with for instance when Christians like St. Augustine for instance look back on the story of Abraham lying or Isaac lying he has to go through all this moral contortion and say well he's not lying because it, um, Sarah is is uh, actually actually his sister slash cousin slash whatever so he's not actually lying he's speaking metaphor blah 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 no 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 that's not originally what the story meant the story meant to show that Abraham was clever or Isaac was clever he can think himself out of dangerous situations okay and so this is the morality of Homer and this is the morality of, of the imagined world of these heroes but it's not a morality that lasts and just as with the church fathers have to look back in the Old Testament and say uh, "Ooh, this looks bad how do we explain this so did the Greeks as well later Greeks the classical era Greeks of, of Plato's age and the Hellenists of, of uh, say uh, Philo's age so Xenophanes for instance in the 6th century so the 500s BC he thought Homer's depiction of the gods was bad stupid he hated it he said gods don't do stuff like that um, they don't lie cheat steal rape blah 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 play games all that and Plato Plato was took it much further right so Plato to the gods to Plato had to be servants of justice so these absolute values of justice okay that wasn't Xenophanes in the fifth century and it certainly wasn't Homer in the eighth century and it certainly wasn't the world prior to Homer so it's super interesting to think about these things um, 
Now, as I said, it's, a, it's an aristocratic morality. Um, it's a, I guess, a Bronze Age, um, you know, brutal life existence kind of thing. Let me just talk about a few things. Um, gifts versus trade. That's another a good example. This is something that the Finley talks a great deal about, and you're not like sure, like, why does he keep talking about gift giving? Well, gift giving is is takes is very prominent in the Iliad and the Odyssey, and he loved describing the gifts. Okay, so as I said, for instance, um, as the leader of the Greeks, uh, Agamemnon dispenses the gifts, uh, or I should say, he dispenses the spoils of war. So he gave, for instance, Achilles um, the slave girl, or the girl that he enslaved. And uh, it's, you know, whether it's, it's that, or it's gold, or bronze armor, or shields, or horses, or whatever, it's described and it's really interesting. Now, one thing Finley says is that uh, this is not about gain, okay? So, for instance, one of the, one of the pl uh, we, we take it for granted that you should always benefit from a monetary transaction but to the greeks of, of this heroic age and of homer's mind that was petty and low and we can see this also in in the old testament the old testament criticizes the phoenicians so does homer the phoenicians were an empire based built on trade on um, it was a ship going society built upon profiting from trade and one person insults uh, Odysseus, also known as Ulysses to the, to, the, to the Romans, by calling him a traitor or a Phoenician or whatever. And that's really low. So money and gifts and trade is about uh, showing your wealth and, and constructing friendships and allegiances and so on, about showing your power. And it's not about profit okay so that's that's another difference between the age of uh, our age or the Hellenistic age and the age of the heroes and of Homer um, the only virtues that mattered to this aristocratic uh, hero culture was bravery skill okay sometimes um, I've noticed that in reading these books sometimes courage and strength are spoken of as the same thing so if you're if you're brave it's because you're strong and if you're like physically strong so the two things are almost spoke as synonymous the exact same thing so that's all that matters courage skill honor that's all that matters N compassion for enemies doesn't matter um none of these other things matter so um oh and let me let me talk about another thing um Maybe just one final difference on the the morality of of that age versus versus ours. We we're a state society, and in in Plato's time, sorry, not Plato, in Homer's time and the time before him, it was family based. And so when you're when you're looking, for instance, at the Odyssey, where um, basically Odysseus's family is being troubled by the suitors, so people who are trying to marry his wife. Penelope now that he's gone and they think he's dead so they're eating him they're eating the Odysseus family out of house and home and is there a police force that they can call and say hey can you get these people out of our house or whatever no there's no such thing uh, and when in the end of the Odyssey when Odysseus kills all the suitors him and his son Telemachus kill all the suitors um, there's no RCMP that's called there's no FBI that's called. Uh, the family of the people who were killed are called. And it's all family-based, not state-based. And so the age of the heroes is an age of families. The great, uh, the great person only exists because he is ruler or head of a great family. He's not a cog in the machine. Okay, so for instance, the great... Uh, the great Athenian generals are just cogs in the machine. Um, they can't be heroes because they're not the full thing. They're not the full power. They don't represent the full power. They're just one 
small cog in a giant machine called Athens or whatever, Persia or, or whatever, or Sparta. So it's, it's really interesting. And what kind of morality rises from that? Um, a family-based morality where the father decides what's right and wrong, how pun people are to be punished or rewarded, even though they're part of a larger community. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? And so this day and age, we say everything's the government's responsibility and fathers have no rights, mothers have no rights, families have no rights. So it's a very different world. Um, it's pretty, pretty cool, pretty interesting to think about. Last thing I'm going to talk about is, I don't know if you've heard about this, but I think a lot of people have, uh, the discovery of Troy uh, in the late 1800s by... Uh, an archaeologist named Schleiman. Well, Finley talks about that in a few spots in the book, and he devotes one of the full appendices to it. Okay? And his position is roundly, he roundly denounces that the place they think is Troy is Troy. It's not. He says, we know it's not Troy because uh, the things that are found in that day and age, and they know that the age sort of archaeologically, doesn't reflect the world of Homer whatsoever. Um, the houses are small. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a poor site. You can tell it's not a, it was never a, the center of a powerful kingdom or empire or city-state or anything. Um, it doesn't reflect the world of, of Homer at all, or I should say the world of his books. So um, he roundly says, no, this, that is not Troy. Did Troy ever exist? Don't know, uh, but it's definitely not that place that Schleiman says it is. Anyway, I love this book. Um, it's not easy for every reader. Uh, I would definitely suggest reading the Iliad and Odyssey first. Uh, I think it's even a little bit harder to to understand than the the uh, the uh, daily life in ancient Israel book that I reviewed last time, but it's not impossible. So read it, chip away at it, whatever. Or you might, you might find it all really quite interesting and get a lot out of it. Anyway, uh, I guess the notes help me because uh, I've, I feel like I've said uh, everything that needs to be said. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, and I hope you like the background of the bright, bright woodsy scene here. Uh, it's a beautiful day. Anyway, hope you are all doing well and uh, all the best and we'll talk to you soon. Bye now.